Hello and welcome everyone in Steelers Nation. My name is Stan Saverin and it's a delight to bring in former Steeler offensive guard, number one draft pick out of Auburn, Kendall Simmons. Kendall, great to see you. How are you? I'm doing good, Stan. Glad to be on your show, man. Oh, it's, it's our pleasure. Uh, you were number one draft choice, 2002. You mm -hmm. played at the highest level of college football. Uh, at least everybody in the SEC would say that. Yeah. Maybe not so much up here, but anyway, uh, we'll, yeah. we'll give you that much. But that having been said, uh, was it a huge transition for you to go from Auburn to the Steelers and, by the way, start every game your rookie year? It was. It was a very big transition. It reminded me of my freshman year when I got to Auburn. Playing, which I guess you say same thing, I feel like with big time football in North Mississippi <laughs> and playing against some of the level of guys I played against who all had really good college careers and a lot of them went on to play in the NFL. I felt like I was big and fast and quick. Once I got to Auburn as a freshman, I was starting as well. And it was like I was moving like a turtle the first week or two compared to everybody else. So I'm like, I can't believe people move this fast on this, this, this big. And it was the same way when I got to Pittsburgh. I'm watching Aaron Smith and Casey Hampton and Kendrell Bell and all those guys fly around. I'm like, ain't no way in the world I'll be able to block any of these dudes, you know? And once you're in it for a while, things start to slow down. And so it, it really felt like I was kind of out of my element big time when I first got to Pittsburgh. Did you anticipate that when the Steelers drafted you that you would be the starting right guard from day one or was there a competition in training camp that you earned that slot? I honestly did not expect it. Um, at the time, I think Oliver Ross was in there at the time. And so Marvell Smith was playing the right time. I think Oliver Ross was in there. And I was just trying to learn the playbook and trying to fit in and not do anything wrong. And once I got my shot, I was just like, you know, I'm going to do the best I can. And Russ was really good at, at helping me out and taking his time with me. And it worked out. Of course, Russ is Russ Grimm, who was the offensive mm -hmm. line coach then. How much of a factor, you mentioned Marvell, uh, how much of a factor was it that you had a veteran guy like Wayne Gandy on your left and you had a veteran center like Jeff Hardings in the middle right next to you? It was it was big help. Jeff was really helpful for me. And all Jeff told me, he said, listen, I'm going to tell you what to do and just do it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, hey. I'm fine with that. I said, all I want to do, I'm going to go full speed. And I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do. Now, Marvell is like my buddy, or my, my big brother. Bell would get mad at me for saying this, but Marvell wouldn't even talk to me. <laughs> he, he barely talked to me. And, and I found out probably like a year or two later, he's like, you was a rookie, and rookies aren't supposed to be talked to at all. You are supposed to be seen and not heard. So he's like, you knew what to do. And if you did, that's your fault. You should learn your playbook. And so I'm like, man, come on. Are you for real? We in a game. And he's like, hey, it is what it is. And yeah, we have a big laugh about it because it's just something he said. They did me the same way when I came. Well, Marvell wasn't terribly loquacious anyway. I mean, he was a quiet guy. He didn't, they didn't speak exactly. a lot to begin with. Um, one guy that I wanted to ask you about um, was the guard on the other side. I'm delighted now that Alan Fanica, long overdue, uh, it will be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And, and I wonder if that same thing applied, uh, given that you were both guards and a lot of your assignments were the same, just reversed on the opposite side. Uh, mm -hmm. How much conversation did you have with Alan and how much of a factor was he in teaching you the position? Alan was a big factor. Um, I learned how to play the game from watching him uh, and his way of going about things. I did not have this skill set. I knew all I knew was to play hard. And I watched Allen go full speed all the time. And some of the things he did were just amazing. Watching him get downfield, block a guy on a pool, don't fall, and he's running another 20, 30 yards downfield. I did not understand what that meant at the beginning when I first got there. But our whole offensive line exemplified that. Jeff Hardings would do the same thing. You know, if the tackles could get in on it, and that's how we played. But Allen set the tone for all of that. And you just try, I tried to follow what he did. I really did. And just talking to him about little things. I picked up new techniques, better ways of taking care of myself, really having to study the game too as well. 
I don't know that I've ever seen a better pulling guard than Alan Fanica. I mean, he pulled, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, some of those running plays. Uh, it, was, it was really amazing. And speaking of the running game, Kendall, it's interesting because you were part of, in essence, a transition. Um, Cordell Stewart had been the starting quarterback in 01. They lost mm -hmm. the AFC Championship game. Your rookie year, he was a starter, and then he got pulled by Bill Cower in favor of Tommy Maddox. And the yes. offense changed dramatically. The Tommy Gunn offense, especially in 03. How did that mm -hmm. change your perspective and the entire perspective of the offensive line? I mean, Jerome was still there. Yeah, it, it, it changed big time. One thing that I loved about Tommy, and I'm glad you brought him up. I've, other than probably Tom Brady, I've never seen a quarterback so fiery and so passionate about the game of football and protecting his teammates and doing whatever he needed to do to try to help the team win. I love playing with Tommy. Um, and it did change everything. And at the time, like you said, you had Jerome back there, which was a lot more athletic than people gave him credit for, in my opinion, for somebody to be as big as he was, but had really good feet and could run. I loved it when it was four minute time. We called it a four minute offense. If Jerome was in there and we had four minutes left to go in the game, 90% of the time you weren't going to get the ball back. And, and I loved it. And to me, it just exemplified what Pittsburgh meant, hard, grinding, and you were going to hurt after the game broke if you played. Did it feel as though, I know offensive linemen, they want to run block. Um, they'll do what they have to do. Um, did you, and I know eventually Bill Cowart, at the end of 03, which was not a good year for the team, uh, he decided... Mm -hmm we've got to get back to, you know, doing what we do uh, and mm -hmm. what he liked, the kind of offense he liked to. Um, as an offensive line, were you glad to get back to more of a, if you will, ground and pound? Yes, I was, because it was, that was, that has always been my mindset since day one. I started playing football and it was the same for the guys that I played with. Um, we passed block when we had to, but we'd rather hit you in the face the whole game. And you knew when we played, if we scored 28 points, that was on the high side, <laughs> you know, because we knew our defense was going to hold people down. And if we could at least get 21 or more, that was a really good game for us. But you knew you're going to run the ball with Coach Kyle at least 60% of the time. And that's how you just use your own to his advantage, man, and let him beat people up. Well, 2004 marked another change um, because Maddox starts the season. He gets hurt. Ben steps in, um, wins. 15 in a row, you go 15 and one, but unfortunately mm -hmm. you were not a part of that. You, you yes. missed the whole season. What was the injury and when did it occur? I tore my ACL two weeks into training camp. Um, me and Aaron Smith was engaged during, uh, I think it was pass rush or something like that. And the crazy thing about it, I mean, you had just talked about this. My wife was pregnant with my oldest and she was walking down the hill at training camp. And she saw me when I went down. Oh. And she was like, oh, my goodness, what's wrong? And so that was my very first major injury. And I knew something wasn't right, but I wanted to go back out there and Norway wouldn't let me. And two weeks later, my oldest daughter was born, who was 16 years old now. So that's what, that's what took me out of that season. Was it tough to watch that run, um, even though it ended unhappily in that AFC Championship game loss at home to the Patriots? Um, was it difficult to, to sit idly by? I mean, whether you won 15 in a row or not, uh, was that the first time you had suffered a significant injury and had to miss a great portion of a season? It, it was. I mean, I had a couple ankle scopes in college while I was here, and it really wasn't that big of a deal. But I knew how good this team was. And I had been part of it and starting since my rookie year, and I wanted to be a part of them going to the Super Bowl. And I'm watching them win game after game after game after game. And I've heard ACLs are so hard to come back from. You had that doubt in your head that I'm not going to be the same dude. This is this is going to be tough. And I'm watching them possibly about to win the Super Bowl with me, without me. It was really hard. Uh, I tell you, one person who really made it easier for me to make that transition, that was Aaron Smith. Aaron done a whole lot for me during my career. That was one of his first major things that he helped me with as a player off the field. He said, Kendall, people don't realize that professional athletes 
don't really get to see that family grow up. You have it, your first child being born. I know you love football, but take advantage of being a father and enjoy that time. It's going to suck watching us and not being out here, but you'll never get that time back with your, with your kid because we all wake up and we're gone when they get ready to go to school or whatever it may be. Most of the time, they get ready to go to bed when we get home. So that's a lot of in-between time that you miss. That made sense to me. And it really, it really helped me. It took me a minute to really accept it, but it helped me. What a leader Aaron was. And of course he went through that with his little boy who thankfully, mm -hmm. um, you know, survived that. Uh, but what, yeah. what, what words of wisdom, but you're back at it in 05, you're back starting and the loss in the <laughs> AFC championship game of service motivation but the yes. season sure didn't play out that way initially. Uh, we've talked yeah. to a lot of guys about that seven and five start, and now you know that you've got to win out just to make the playoffs as a wild card. Mm -hmm. Can you take us back to you're sitting there at seven and five? Was there a team meeting? Did Bill Cower say anything? Did you uh, get together as groups and say, "Look, we have no more margin for error"? We did. Um... You saw that that was the that team was close, but that, that team grew so much during that time. We all came together and everybody was look, you gotta hold each other accountable. No messing around. We know what we have here, and this might be our only shot at getting this done. We put it a lot of it was emphasis on this is being Jerome's last time. Then Dick LeBeau was getting inducted into the Hall of Fame. So it was so much that played out during that season that gave us motivation. And then the coaches spent a lot of time putting the game plan together. I've never been a part of anything during that time right then where I felt like if we do what we need to, there's no way nobody's going to beat us at that time. And no one did. Um, eight in a yeah. row, as a matter of fact. You put your minds to it, but um, it wasn't a walk in the park. Uh, we've yep. talked to so many people, including Brian McFadden, not long ago about the Indianapolis game. Uh, he, of course, um, was on defense uh, you know, at the time, but mm -hmm. you were on offense right there when Jerome fumbled that ball. It just shocked the world, not yes. to mention Jerome. Can you take us back to that play? You're right in the thick of it. I mean, he ran right behind yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Can you take us through what happened as it as you remember it? That's what we had ran that play a couple of times during the game. And I had Gary Brack, a little small linebacker. He was really good for Indianapolis at the time. And I got him a couple of times before that. But we we're right there, probably like the one or two yard line. I'm like, okay, well, this is a touchdown. Our uh, same thing, double with Jeff and climb up to Gary Brack. I tripped and fell. Gary Brack is shot through, perfect helmet on the ball. And the ball just popped out. Like Jerome turned around. It's almost like he threw it back. And I looked, and I'm like, oh, my goodness. And he ain't never fumbled the ball, not while I was playing with him anyway. <laughs> and all I knew was just to get up and run. That is it. And so it was fortunate at the time <laughs> that, that Ben clipped him. And I feel like if Ben wasn't going to get him, Jeremy Tooman was right behind him, too. And then if you look at the film, you see me come flying in at the last second. Wasn't even close, but had to make some type of dramatic gift anyway. Well, Ben was the hero. Uh, actually, yeah. Mike Vanderjack was a hero, too, as, as, it, uh, yeah, as it turns uh, turns out. And so is Brian McFadden, who made a couple of mm -hmm. great plays in the end zone um, against Reggie Wayne, no less. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering, at the time, or slightly thereafter, while the defense was on the field, did you feel responsible? Oh, no, I slipped and fell. I didn't get my guy. He was able to get his helmet on the ball. And Jerome? You know what? I, don't, I honestly don't remember. I would probably say part of me did at the time because I'm like, that was one of the mistakes that you just didn't want to happen, and especially during that crucial part of the game because it was so close. Um, and I look at the picture now, every now and then, I'm like, if you could have just picked this foot up, you would have been fine. And you would have fumbled. But it was just a perfect play. It really was. Well, after that, I would imagine there was a huge sigh of relief, not just on the team, but all through Western Pennsylvania and Steelers yeah. Nation. Uh, people still talk about that game. Now it's on to Detroit. Um, and, of course, everybody will remember 
organizing so that Jerome ran out on the field? Was mm -hmm. obviously everybody was aware except for Jerome? Yeah, he was. Everybody, everybody knew what was going to happen. And he turned around and looked like, okay, where's everybody at? <laughs> it was perfect. It really was. That, that entire week was like walking on cloud nine. And I just, I couldn't imagine it working out as good as it did at any other time. Did, you mentioned this a little bit earlier, how much of a factor was getting to the Super Bowl in Jerome's hometown a motivating factor for this team? And again, I mean, you had come close in 2004, losing the AFC Championship game. But, so that's motivation right there. But how much mm -hmm. of a motivation was the fact that this might be Jerome's last game and he was playing in his hometown? It was, it was huge. Um, I haven't been around a team that loved a player as much as they did Jerome. Jerome could mingle and hang out, put his thumb on guys, push buttons on either side of the ball, and guys respected him. And I, I haven't been around anything like that before. And that was just amazing to me to see that and how the guys were putting all that work in. And it, and it was it was for him. Yes, it was a Super Bowl, but it was one of the things like, okay, we, we got to go out on top here. Put, put winning it on, in his hometown. Dick LeBeau coached here, you know, played here and all this kind of stuff. That's icing on the cake. We, we got to do it. So it, it was definitely a lot of motivation with that. What was it like for you to play in the Super Bowl? It's every player's dream to win a championship. Uh, did it seem like just another game once you got into it? Um, were you able to calm your nerves or were you nervous at all heading into it? I wish I could put words into how nervous I was. Um, it was, I felt like I was having a panic attack the entire time. And, and all of us did until Willie Parker broke that long run. And the game was moving so much faster than any other game that I've ever played in. It's like you just, it's, you couldn't catch your breath and it was so loud. And it felt like the guys on Seattle defensive line, it's like people were shooting them out of cannon. And I'm like, okay, it's like hitting a brick wall the whole time. And so we can't get any movement. We can't get any movement. It's like something, we got to do something. And everybody was just pushing so hard. And Hines are on the Hines saying, calm down. Every last one of us are trying to do way too much. Just do your job. That's all he kept saying, just do your job. And we ran the power. Allen pulled around and me and Max Stark doubled that three technique and made a wall and Allen pulled around and really went right off Allen's butt and it was like, okay, now we can play football now. I want to ask you about that play because that's a famous Allen Willie Parker play, longest mm -hmm. Super Bowl run in history. What was your assignment on that play? And do you remember what you did on that play? Me and Max had a double team to the backside linebacker. And my whole job was I just said, Max, hey, I'm gonna get him up. You knock him across me and climb. And I, I just held on to the three technique and walled him off. And Max hit him on the hip and climbed up. And I think it was uh, number 51, his last name, uh, Lofa Tutuku or something like that. I forgot his last name. But he was first-round pick in my class as well. Uh, linebacker, young guy, real good player. Uh, so I, um, Max got up to him. And it was I think it was like 36 power that we ran. I think it was the name of the play. And nobody catches Willie Parker from behind. Nope. That's, no, no. That's, that's pretty evident. Um, a great Super Bowl win, uh, obviously. Um, we move on. Uh, 2006 ends up being Bill Cowher's last year. 2007, Mike Tomlin comes in. Uh, was there a distinct change in the Steelers' atmosphere with the change of coaches when Tomlin came in? It was. Um... Younger guy, very upbeat, practices went more to me to a college style, um, whole lot of fundamental work in the beginning, longer, <laughs> longer practices, um, and, and just really own you about all the little details. Not to say Coach Cow wasn't, but Coach Cow was, he was like, okay, you're professional. You're supposed to know what to do. And he would always say, I don't want to be out here no longer than you do. So the longer, the better, the better you practice, the quicker we get out of here. Um, 
And Tomlin wasn't that way in the first, in the beginning. It was like, okay, we're going to do it this way. I've watched y'all on film. We got a lot of fundamental errors that we need to work on, and we're going to do this. And that was really tough in the beginning. It really was. Um, but the team needed it because the team was transitioning into being a younger team at the time. And I think that's one of the things where he kind of recognized that we needed it as a core. 2008 is a bittersweet year for you. It's sweet for the Steelers, who win another Super Bowl. Um, and you were part of the team, but you weren't able to play. Uh, mm -hmm. You tore your Achilles tendon. Uh, I remember seeing you in Tampa the week of the, leading up to the Super Bowl, and Ben took all the offensive linemen out to dinner. Uh, I happened to stumble into the same restaurant, and there you were with this big plaster cast on. Um, mm -hmm. That had to be difficult for you. It really was. Um, Monday Night Football against Baltimore Ravens. I remember the play, ran it 15,000 times, and nobody was in 15, 20 yards of me when it happened. And I felt like somebody hit me in the back of the foot with a baseball bat. I'm like, what is, what happened? And when I stood up, I knew exactly what it was. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. You know, and that, and that was tough. That one probably affected me more than the ACL being diagnosed with diabetes, anything else. Because I guess you say I was the old head on the team, on the offensive line. And, and I knew we had a good team and I wanted to be a part of that. So that one was really difficult to sit there and watch. I had to really learn how to keep myself engaged with the young guys and not withdraw as much and try to help Darnell Stapleton took over my spot and um, help him out as much as I could and just try to remain engaged in everything. Well, you end up with your second ring, but unfortunately, that is the end of your Steeler career. Um, mm -hmm. You played briefly with the Bills and the Patriots in 09, and then that was it. When you look back, Kendall, do you think that the injuries that we've described here, in essence, ended your career prematurely? Um, yes and no. Uh, I, I, and I think about that all the time, man. I'm glad you brought that up. For years, I've thought about that. It was time for me to go. God had some other stuff he wanted me to do with, 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 um, with my life. And I transitioned over into being a patient ambassador for type 1 diabetes. And I did not realize how much I would enjoy that being able to share my faults and the things I've dealt with throughout my career playing football and leading up my journey with um, developing diabetes. Uh, that was something that I will never forget. And I, I, I'm still kind of doing it to this day. That started in 2010 for me. And I absolutely enjoyed every second of it. That's being around kids and trying to help those people out. Well, that's wonderful. Giving back, um, uh, you know, teaching people that they, not only can live with diabetes, but they can excel. Uh, you know, you're a highly skilled professional athlete, and here you are. You didn't let it defeat you or hinder you during your career. Um, and hats off to you, Kendall, for you know being able to share that. That is is very admirable. Thank you. Appreciate it. I know. I know you. And I'm, I'm going to back up just a second. You know you. I know you've heard a lot of athletes probably tell you this. I, I went out to Arizona and passed the physical. Russ Grimm, and then I guess you call it Pittsburgh or the West. Everybody was headed out there, and Wisdom Hunt was a guy. And Russ just told me, he said, yep, we got a preseason game. Everything's going good. We'll work on probably trying to bring you in once we get back with the game. We're done with the game. And at that point, my body was already telling me that this is not going to work. You know, I I'm done. Mentally, I was still in it, but my body wasn't responding. And that was one of the hardest decisions I had to make was that – I. I can't physically, I can't do this anymore. And it was kind of time. And then that's when Allen left the Jets. And, and, and then Allen ended up out there too. So it, it was it was time. It, it was. And it took a while for me to kind of come to grips with it. And that leads us to what you're doing now. You're back home or close to home, not Mississippi, but uh, you're back yeah. at um, Auburn University. Yes, I am. And, and I'm actually going in my third year as offensive line coach assistant and uh, offensive analyst. It's my third year doing that. And my goal, hopefully in the next maybe three to five years, hopefully shorter than that, is to 
be the offensive line coach somewhere, if not back here at all. That's my plan. Well, I have no doubt now, with your level of determination that you'll achieve whatever you set your mind to. Uh, Kendall, just a personal note, uh, there have been a lot of Steelers that I've been around. Uh, none more uh, do I admire more than, than you. Uh, you're a personable guy. You're a bright guy. You're a dedicated guy. Um, you've shown your soul by sharing your experiences with others. Um, it's really been a, a delight to have the opportunity to kind of catch up with you today. Thank you so much. Hey, I appreciate that, Stan. That means a lot, man. Thank you.